Now continue hearing from the authors who were nominated in the traditional Trillium Book Award category. To start off, I invite Stephen Hyten to read from his nominated book of short stories, The Dead Are Mostly Visible, published by Alfred Knopf Canada. Now every story in The Dead Are More Visible underscores Hyten's ease with language and his curious original style. Stephen. Thanks. Do, do I hear Christian Book at the back of the room? Um, thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to read a short passage from about a third of the way into the, the title story, The Dead Are More Visible. Uh, it concerns a middle-aged uh, woman parks worker who's flooding um, a skating rink at about three in the morning when she gets drawn into a confrontation from which one of her assailants uh, does not emerge unscathed. Uh, and it's set in a real park in Kingston called Skeleton Park, once the city's main cemetery, so about 20,000 bodies are actually buried under the surface of the park. Third night of flooding, 2 a.m. Plenty of work in the corners and along the boards where the ice always grew rucked and pebbled. The middle of the shinny rink was still sunken and would take another 1,000 liters from the hose, but both rinks would be ready by morning. At first tonight, the man hadn't been there. Then maybe a half hour ago, he'd appeared. She had to guess the time because she hadn't heard or seen him arrive. If this were one of her horror novels, he would be a ghost risen out of the earth of the old graveyard. She'd been easing the hose head back and forth, adrift in her night thoughts, which moved erratically, curving, burrowing, doubling back, unlike day thoughts, which had more practical places to get to. When she looked up and there he was, confronting the obelisk closer to it tonight. On the second night, they'd exchanged hellos, nothing more. She'd sensed his deepening seriousness and concentration. Maybe he was getting frustrated, too, or scared of failure. Did crazy men fear failure the way sane men did? Thinking of her husband, Gavin, now, all his short-lived ventures. His departure had been a relief in some ways. Making a driven man feel important was an unfinishable job. But she missed him, too. Night she did. For some moments she dwelled on missing Gavin in the nights. Then she looked up, hoarse, drunken, shouting. Three kids, it looked like, crossing Balaclava Street, coming up the path. She'd lived here long enough to know trouble at a glance. They had the grim reaper look, slumpy, faceless, in layers of dark, baggy, hooded sweatshirts. One of them had a biker jacket over his sweatshirt. Sure enough, they came to a slouching halt on the path not far behind the man who was facing away from them, apparently unaware. One of them, tall and skinny, was holding something like a crowbar. She shuffled out from behind the boards and stood in the open between the rinks, keeping an eye on developments. Now the taunts began, too slurred and soft at first to make out. The crazy man didn't move or glance back. The kid in the biker jacket was edging up. Hey, man, I've been hearing about you. His voice was firmer, clearer than the others. Hey, stare at this man. He shoved the man in the back, not hard, and the man did turn, slowly, pivoting from the waist up. Leave him alone, she called. The hooded faces turned to her in cartoon unison. In other circumstances, it would have been funny. The man swiveled back into his posture. The kid in the biker jacket started right towards her, hands in his jacket pockets. In her stomach, a downrush of fear. I'll stop there. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>